As we're assembling again for our next session, session I just wanted to say a couple words um, and, and give a few plugs. So the, the entire event is being live streamed. I'll sort of give you an update later on how many people are watching from afar. We know that there are some of our former researchers who are listening in right now watching it online. Um, I also wanted to say that the um, Twitter hashtag is hashtag IMTFI. Um, a number of people have been tweeting throughout the day. Please feel free to join in. Um, the conference today also just got picked up on two forums that cross over between academia and industry. One of them is academia and the finance industry. The other is academia and um, consumer market studies. Um, that's the, the Socializing Finance blog. Um, if you're interested, you can take a look. It's socializing with an S because of the UK. And, um, and it's the, the other one is the um, Charisma Network, which is a consumer market um, information and research um, um, venue. So they're doing that. Um, our, uh, people have asked a little bit for a little bit more detail about um, our model, how we go about kind of finding the people that, that we've ended up supporting so that you could all come here. And I just wanted to say a couple words on that. As I've mentioned, we issue a global call for proposals every year which we craft here at UC Irvine in consultation with our various partners. The proposals come in, and then um, I'm very pleased that we have an academic board here at UC Irvine made up of faculty from across the entire university, from business, computer science, sociology, law, and so on. Um, you heard from Funmi Arewa uh, at the very beginning of the conference, who moderated the first one from the School of Law. She's on our academic board. Um, as well as um, Aladi Venkatesh from the Paul Mirage School of Business. Just wave your hand, there he is. And uh, Julie Aliachar from the Anthropology Department, who was here, but Julie, are you here? There, you, there she is, way in the back, from the Anthropology Department as well. So um, we have an academic board. There's other people too, but they're not all here. Then we have an industry board. And the industry board has representation from the payments industry, IT, um, and, and design, and it's been very, very helpful to us to have the opinions of that industry board as we think about making sure that our work reaches um, these wider audiences. So that's kind of how we do it, that's how we make our decisions that lead to um, those of you who are here now. So um, our next panel is uh, Gender in Mobile Money and Financial Practices. Um, I wanted to call your attention to a recent um, executive summary that we put together. This is in the back of the room um, that summarizes some of the projects that we've done that have to do with gender and mobile money and financial inclusion. Um, so you can go take a look at that. If you're interested, it's in the back. Um, and we have new work in progress that's going to be presented in a minute. I'm very pleased to um, introduce as our moderator, Rebecca Mann. She's a program officer at, uh, in the financial services for the poor team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And her grants and projects are focused on research data collection and measurement. Previously, she was a corporate lawyer at Herbert Smith Freehills in London and Brussels and has degrees from the London School of Economics and the University of Sydney. So Rebecca, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Bill. And I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, our grant to IMTFI is one of the most important grants that we have uh, in the financial services for the core team at the Gates Foundation because of the depth and the breadth and the quality of the research that we see here. I'm very excited to introduce our panelists today. We have Jude and Charles from uh, Namdi Azikawa University in Nigeria, uh, Mudita and Deepti from IFMR in India, and Idris from the National Events School of Applied Statistics uh, from Statistics and Applied Studies in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, to frame this session a little, uh, gender is important because we know from data sources like the Global Findex that women are less likely to be involved in the formal financial sector than men. And this means that they have less of a capacity to absorb uh, and respond to economic shocks and to capitalize on opportunities to climb out of poverty. And digital financial services might be able to bridge this gap if they can recognize and address the differences between men and women, the differences in the way that they earn money, the differences in the way that they spend money, and the differences in the way that they save. We know that women often earn money in smaller increments uh, in more regular periods than men, and, so, and, the, and spend money tend on household uh, 
uh, expenses that tend to go in and out very quickly. Um, but these kind of differences between men and women are not well understood. And even though the research in this area is growing, there's still a lot of work to be done to understand how to design products, uh, programs, and policies that can really advance financial inclusion for women. And so the research that we're hearing today is important because it does this in, uh, across the different papers in four main ways. First, uh, the research that we're seeing documents the financial behaviors uh, of women and girls when it comes to financial services. It also looks at products that might address some of these needs. Um, it explores some of the social and the cultural obstacles that women and, and men have uh, in adopting digital financial services. And it also starts to explore some of the impacts that we might see if digital financial services are uh, adopted and used at scale. And so for this reason, I'm really excited to introduce our first panelist, uh, Jude and Charles, who are going to talk to us about some of the work that they've done in rural Nigeria. Good afternoon. I'm Jude, and my co-investigator is Charles. We're from Nigeria. The focus of our study was we tried to look at the interaction, the interface between mobile money and financial practices of rural women, the interface between mobile money and cooperatives, the dynamics cooperatives, and then the interface between mobile money and the traditions of people. Okay, thank you. It's an important innovation, mobile money, but it could upset a number of things. It could upset existing practices. It could also upset some behavior. It could also upset group dynamism. So the purpose of our study is to look at what happens when mobile money interfaces with people's culture, interfaces with the financial behavior of rural women, and also when it interfaces with the joint liability scheme of cooperative. We have three objectives here. The first one looks at the traditional modes of storing wealth and how mobile money adoption could alter their usage. The second objective was to look at how mobile money adoption could offset the financial behavior of rural women. And the third is to look at how mobile money adoption could affect the practices of cooperatives and probably the joint liability scheme of cooperative. Why this story is important is to make sure that Mobile money, although a good innovation, that it doesn't affect other poverty reduction efforts like microfinance. Okay. Um, we use structured interview, and people we studied were people, women who were members of cooperatives who live on less than two dollars per day. So far, we have been able to interview 418 women from 30 cooperatives. I want to be fast. These are the characteristics of the respondents. About 38 of them had no formal education. And this is the age distribution of the respondents. This is the household size. We were able to realize that um, up to 73% had more than six persons in the family. And we look at the income. People we said who earn less than $2 per day. And from the preliminary examination, we have 18% earn less than $1 per day and about 82% earn above $1, but less than $2 per day. We looked at their job status. They were office cleaners, casual workers, petty farmers, hawkers, sales attendants, and apprentices. These were their occupations. And we look at ownership of mobile phones. We understand that about 99% of them own mobile phones. And what they do with mobile phone, they use it to make calls, to send texts, to download music and pictures. And when we try to understand about ownership of bank accounts, we discovered that only 93 of them do not have bank accounts. 5% had account with microfinance banks, and only 2% had savings account with conventional um, commercial banks. And cooperative membership, 22% belong to formal cooperatives, 36% belong to kindred or related cooperatives, while 42 belong to faith-related cooperatives. And the two major reasons why they um, joint cooperative, we have for sociocultural reasons and to be able to assess credits. Nigeria is unique when it comes to mobile money. 
In fact, Nigeria is perhaps the only country in the world where you have more than 10 mobile money operators, but we have the least number of users. Um, we have about 10 of them. Look at them here, Paga, MTB, GTB, MTM Mobile Money, Easy Money, First Money, EcoBank Mobile Money, Fortis, Stambic, Vcash, and FET. From our respondents, we realize that 8% of them have not even, only 8% of them have, have heard about mobile money, and only 3% have used the services. And this is against what's obtainable in urban area, where you have 46% who have heard about mobile money in urban areas, but only 16% were users. And what they do with my money, especially in urban areas, they use it to, for airtime top up, payment of bills, and occasional fund transfer. We try to understand. Um, why the problem existed and the following were discovered. Nigeria decided to choose bank-led model instead of the operator-led model in uh, mobile money technology and that problem was low awareness in rural area. Um, the structure of Nigerian mobile money is that it exists more in urban centers and the major problem is conflicting regulatory framework between the the Central Bank of Nigeria and National Communication Commission. And the important problem is distrust. Distrust people have on the government and on business organizations, and then the scanty number of memory of agents. These were the problems. When we went to the field, these were some comments we were able to get. A first woman said that she's going to use my money if people they trust, like priests, religious leaders, tell them about it. And that woman said that she's not comfortable with it, but she can use it if people in their church um, encourage that. Another person said, who knows if this is not an just scam from government and telecom operators to defraud poor people. Another person raised the question and said, if it is that useful, how come many women in our churches are not using it? And that comment that we, God said, I can use it to transfer money, but not to save money. Who will I report to if my money disappear the way our airtime used to disappear? That's about the distrust people have on government and telecom operators. Another person said, how many of the agents are stable in their location? How many can I rely on for my transaction? It's still about the issue of trust. And the last person there said, they can use it in their homes. When we ask about the issue of using cooperatives, some say they can use it in their home, but not in this cooperative except you are ready for arguments and quarrels. Okay, so these are the financial, the financial habits of rural women. On the savings, we realize that many of them save at home. Many of them use informal savings club to save their money. Many save with friends and family. Many save using cooperatives. And many save with shopkeepers, people that own shops and stores in their location. And many also save through thrift collectors. One important thing we understand from the study is that the poor people save. We realize that up to 20%, they save up to 20% of, the, of their income. Under how they accumulate capital, we realize that they use advanced payment to accumulate capital. Um, maybe they want to buy something, say television, they will go to the seller and keep paying money until they complete the payment. Um, they accumulate it also with a shopkeeper. Sometimes when they go to market every four days, any income or revenue they realize, they keep it with a shopkeeper until the money grows big before they could use it to make the purchases. And they also do home savings. They save at homes, inside books, under the bed, mattresses. They also lend to people in time of need. So we realize that some of them, when they have enough, they could spend it. So what they do is, when they have plenty, they could lend to friends, lend to family members, and in time of um, scarcity, they could now go and ask people to, to pay them back. How they receive and transfer money? through families, through friends, and through bus drivers. And these are purposes for transferring money, for emergency help, for school fees, for health reasons, and for membership dues. How do they deal with emergencies, like sickness, ill health, accidents? They call on family members, they call on their in-laws. They go to churches. For those who are church members, they go to their churches for help during emergencies. They also rely on personal savings, and they also go to their cooperatives. What about borrowing? They go to their cooperatives too. They borrow from deities. This is another inroad into the study, the important role deities play in their culture. We discover that prominent deities play 
um, a very serious financial role. In fact, prominent deities perform basic banking functions like lending, keeping of deposit, serving, giving advisory services, serving as guarantors, um, going for defaulters. We still come to that. Then their spending habit, 30% of their monthly income, daily income are spent on food, 10% on maintaining membership of different groups, 20% on savings, and 15% is to assist others. Frequency of repayment, when they take the loan, how they repay. Many of them use single payments, they pay once and it goes. Other people pay monthly and others pay every four days. This is another important inroad into the study. We are trying to look at traditional methods of storing wealth. How do they store wealth? And first of all, we look at girl side and marriage. It's an important way of storing wealth in the culture we studied. Um, how do they use girl side to store money or to store wealth? The bride price, the postnatal visit. Um, in the culture we studied, in-laws have important roles to play. Um, during ceremonies, burial rites, they have um, special obligations there. So when a woman has a girl child, she begins to train the girl child, believing that it's a source of wealth for the family in terms of the benefit they will reap from the in-laws, especially in time of need. They also their ruminants as a way of storing wealth. When they go to market and get some money, they could use them to buy ruminants and keep. Another interesting way to store wealth is through title taking. If they take title, they believe is a way of um, being able to assess future help, future services. Then jewelries, sorry, household utensils. Sometimes if you come to the site we studied, you see home full of utensils. Not that they are using them, but they use it as a way of saving um, wealth. Then we talk about jewelries here. We talk about apprenticeship. It's another important way of storing wealth. The, the kind of apprenticeship they practice over there is that it's a relationship between a master and a servant, whereby the apprentice serves the master for a period, maybe two, three, four, five years. At the end of the period, the master now settles the apprentice by providing him or her with cash and physical infrastructures and contacts to be able to start the business. So it's a way of storing and transferring wealth. Membership of groups. There's a particular group that when you belong to, it will give you access to some resources, to some people. So people save a lot, believing that once they be able to become members of such group, they will get more. Then church. In fact, church and deities, this one is a deity, they play important roles when it comes to storing wealth. We're able to discover that prominent deities are used to store wealth. People keep their valuables with deities because of the respect and the trust they have. They keep their valuables there. They keep money with the deities through the high priest that perform sacrifices. They keep their wealth there. And sometimes they could even hand over economic trees, hand over their farms to the deity to take care of them. So it's another important way of storing wealth. Then churches too. Churches are becoming prominent leaders. Since many people are leaving African religion and moving to Christianity, there's need to transfer the function. So some priests and prophets and pastors are now performing some services which high priests used to perform, like giving advice services, like keeping up valuables. If you go to some homes, their valuables are kept by the ministers of God whom they trust and also the money. Okay, we look at the effect of mobile money on mobile money adoption on this traditional mode of storing wealth. And we discover that when they interface, the effect will not be much. Why? Because people who use this social or traditional money do it for sociocultural reasons, not because there were no other options. So the usage was not economic in nature, rather it was symbolic and sociocultural. However, mobile money adoption is going to reduce the use of bus drivers, uh, family members and ladies for money transfer. It's going to also raise the level of involvement of women in making household financial decisions. It's going to reduce borrowing from deities because sometimes going to borrow from deities, the implication is much. Some deities, if the person is unable to pay, the penalty is much. They could come after the family with debt, with penalty, and um, number of sacrifices. So mobile money adoption is also going to reduce dependence 
on in-laws, on family members, and on churches during emergencies. It will also reduce the use of cash in making payments. Not only that, it will reduce the use of advanced payment, thrift collectors, lending to others in time of need as a way of accumulating capital. We also look at effect of more money adoption on cooperative practices. And we, from our preliminary uh, finding, we discover that it's going to affect financial recordings and documenting in cooperatives. And it's also going to affect financial relationship among members. However, it's not going to affect the attendance to cooperative functions because there are other reasons why people attend to cooperative, like to sing, to socialize with one another. But when it comes to the financial part of it, normal adoption could upset a number of issues there. Then we come to the, the joint liability scheme of cooperative on which microfinance hinges on. Um, we discover that small money adoption is going to affect a number of things like the peer screening, the peer monitoring, information asymmetry, kinship ties among cooperatives and the level of trust. The fear is that when people adopt mobile money, they could perform transactions without anyone's knowledge and it'd be difficult to monitor each other. However, when we ask them, what do you think could be the solution? They said, except there will be high level of adoption. Maybe over 80% of members will adopt um, mobile money. Then it will be easier for all of them to flow on that platform. And that they gave us that new checks and balances will be adopted in the cooperatives and that mobile money agents will be members of the cooperative so that they could dictate fraud and other activities that could come up. And then that they should also link mobile money accounts to lenders' monitoring platform. Because lenders felt that if these people begin to use mobile money, they will not be able to trace their financial transactions again. So this study raised three new questions that we we'll focus on trying to answer. Because we realize that religious leaders on Christian side talk about the pastors, the priests, that they are being respected and their ways are very, very strong when it comes to making financial decisions. And on the African traditional religion side, the high priest there and the deities, their ways are very, very strong. People see them as role models, people that can trust their word. How can we use them to build trust and create awareness when it comes to mobile money? That's the first question we raise. And that question is, since we've now discovered that mobile money adoption could um, affect some service, some financial services in corporate, the joint liability scheme, the peer monitoring, the peer screening, what mechanism are we going to put in place to make sure that it doesn't work against the joint liability scheme? And the last question is, under what condition is bank-led model preferable to operator-led model? Because in Nigerian circumstance, many believe that um, low adoption of my money is because the uh, Central Bank of Nigeria prefer bank-led model to operator-led model. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a presentation after lunchtime. Um, so I'll try to make it interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Dipti Kesi, and I'm with my co researcher and my friend Mudita Tiwari here. Uh, today, we are going to discuss about how we design financial literacy tools for women entrepreneurs and migrant population. Uh, and we'll discuss if uh, you know there's a scope for, or if we can use these financial literacy tools to expand adoption of uh, mobile banking services. Uh, this is the uh, second part of the study. Uh, the first part, which was also uh, funded by IMTFI, uh, uh, the, the we studied uh, in Dharavi, which was in 2013. Uh, uh, and we chose this slum, Dharavi, which is the largest slum in Asia. Uh, and uh, this particular slum is interesting because uh, this has more than 5,000 informal uh, small-scale enterprises in the slum. 
So we really want, at that time, we were really interested in finding what uh, uh, social, cultural, and uh, business factor is influencing the uh, preference for cash transaction over uh, electronic transaction. Uh, uh, and also uh, to understand if there is a scope for mobile banking amongst uh, the small scale uh, enterprises or business owners. Uh, and just to ensure that we capture holistic perspectives, uh, we interviewed different st stakeholders from demand side as well as supply side. So we interviewed business owners, uh, their clients, their suppliers, as well as we interviewed bank manager and banking agents. And uh, uh, quickly, uh, we found uh, obviously cash is culturally uh, accepted. Uh, access was not issue. Um, business owners had access to banking services, uh, but they were using cash uh, for two main reasons. One was they wanted to um, save on taxes. It was that simple. They just didn't want to pay to the government, and so they wanted hidden transaction, uh, simple. But the other uh, reason which were more interesting to both of us was there was also this huge lack of awareness and uh, trust in uh, financial products, which was impeding the uh, the take up of the uh, mobile banking services. Uh, so that study, the, our first study, we recognized two groups: uh, one, uh, women entrepreneurs; the other, migrant population. We thought if these two groups are provided with enough information about financial products uh, and some sort of financial literacy uh, trainings, they have potential to take up the uh, mobile banking services. Uh, Quickly, uh, migrant laborers, because we have discussed about it before in this forum also, that they come to the city to earn money, they save, they remit money. Uh, you know, we all know about their financial behavior, and we all know that they use informal resources to remit money, uh, even to save money, all those things. So we thought, like, maybe this um, population, the migrant population, can be uh, informed about Tatkal agents uh, that is available in India uh, to remit money, or even something like, you know, um, employers uh, directly transferring some portion of uh, their salary uh, to their bank account in native villages. Uh, they might not have active uh, bank uh, accounts in the city, but invariably uh, they have some household level uh, bank account in the village. So if they are remitting money, maybe employer can transfer some portion of the um, salary. And, and most of them were not aware of uh, that service also. But today, since we are going to talk about women in this forum, uh, uh, so I'll f I will focus on uh, our tools and for women entrepreneurs. So what Mudita and I did, uh, we followed, apart from uh, our 100 uh, business owners, we also followed 25 uh, um, women entrepreneurs for, for around two months. We made multiple visits to uh, and just to understand their financial behavior. Um, and these 25 women uh, entrepreneurs had separate source of income. Uh, all of them had bank accounts and even uh, the closest bank branch was not really that far away for them. It was within one kilometer range on an average. Uh, but only one in three women had ever conducted bank, bank transaction, and we were following them, and we noticed that they always go to banks uh, accompanied by some male members, mostly by husbands, if not uh, their sons. Um, and they were saving money because they had separate their source of income, but instead of depositing their money uh, on, on a bank, they were using uh, higher risk and unregulated saving services such as cheat funds. Um, one thing that we learned, and it was very interesting to both of us, it's uh, something new thing for us also, was they were using all these, um, they had all these strategies to hide their money um, uh, in their house itself because they really wanted to save. Uh, many times they had to give the money to their husbands and their children, and th sometimes they were not able to save. So they were hiding money in like uh, wherever they could. I mean, there's we could come up with so many stories, and we have shared some stories out there back, uh, and the some uh, some stories are there, we have said, but they were hiding money inside the pi uh, uh, food jar, and the pile of clothes, uh, inside the talcum powder box, uh, wherever they could think of. Uh, sometimes they were using really dirty box because nobody can guess that there's money inside. Uh, there's this really interesting stories. Um, uh, and, w and what we also noticed was many times, 
their husbands found their money and took away their money. And in such cases, there were invariably there were do domestic disputes uh, and sometimes leading to domestic violence also. And at least in our sample, when we were following these 25 women, at least 16 women, which is almost two in three women, had some sort of domestic uh, disputes, uh, sometimes domestic violence also, because you know they were losing their money and because of all these things. And just just to remember that all of the, these women had bank accounts. They had this option of just going to the bank and uh, depositing the money. Um, that's when Mudita and I thought, like you know, what is really needed is some sort of financial literacy for these women. Uh, and Mudita is going to talk more about our financial literacy tools uh, that we have developed for women. And also we have developed this tool for migrant population also. Just briefly, I want to share our result. We tested our module with 120 uh, migrants uh, just two months ago. Uh, so w what we did was like we made multiple visits. We didn't want to give all the information in one go. We wanted to understand their financial behavior uh, when they are getting this uh, training or information about financial products. So we made around three visits in a month time. Uh, 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 before we started our training, only 34% were aware of mobile banking. And after the training, 87% visit visited banking agents after the training session, which was a very positive uh, result for us. Also, what we did uh, was we asked this uh, migrant population to maintain one financial diary uh, when we were giving this training. Uh, and we asked this migrant population to uh, just to record their daily expenses. Uh, and we told them about uh, kind of expenses under necessary expenses like you have to pay the rent, you have to pay fee for toilet facilities, you have to eat, you have to spend on food, uh, you know, you have to use mobile phones, all these things are necessary uh, expenses. We didn't tell them like why you th they should spend more or spend less. We just told them this is necessary. But we also told them there is something called temptation expenses and we just to ask them if you could control on it, something like gambling or consumption of alcohol or number of cigarettes, uh, all these things. Um, and we just asked them to record all those expenses. And you can see here their income is erratic. That is all of us know. But some f uh, there was a, some t a decrease in the uh, expenses uh, you know, when they were getting this training and as well as when they were maintaining the financial diary. Especially on temptation expenses, there were almost 50% decrease by the time we visited them for the third time. Uh, and also some decrease in around 20, 23% decrease in necessary expenses also. They cut down on mobile phone expenses, some on food. Uh, but we saw there was a decrease in expenses. That's why there was kind of, you can see the, uh, you know, slightly there is an increase in, in, in savings, um, which was again a very promising result for us. Uh, this is again, uh, we just finished this testing and hopefully we'll be able to share more results. Um, so I'm going to give it to Mudita who will talk about financial uh, our financial literacy tools. Um, so as Diti was mentioning uh, really quickly, one thing that we noticed quite early on uh, and something that our respondents, both women entrepreneurs as well as uh, the migrant uh, workers said is um, the lack of information was definitely impeding the take up of financial products and services. So that is something that we consistently heard and there was definitely a demand for, these, uh, for this information. So uh, the first thing we did is we went to the field, uh, looked for some generic material that was avail available readily in the market already, um, and we went back uh, to our respondents uh, and did some piloting. But what we realized quickly is that obviously generic information doesn't really click. People weren't able to relate to the stories, the characters. Um, not only that, we realized that there was just not enough emphasis on cash versus mobile banking options that are available now, especially to this subset of respondents. Uh, one important thing we felt is that the behavioral biases that, un that sort of uh, impede the decision-making process, the financial decision-making process, was also uh, completely unaddressed in a lot of these generic uh, materials. For example, uh, we found that um, 
forgetfulness uh, was an important issue. People forgot how much they needed to save over the short term and quite often the long term. And uh, as a result, they weren't able to either save enough or they were overspending. Cash on hand presented a lot of problems, as Deepthi was saying, for women, but also for the migrant workers. So these were consistent problems that we were seeing uh, that our respondents were facing, and they definitely were quite interested uh, and excited about the, you know, getting the financial uh, information through us, or even through banks for that, f for that matter. Um, so basically we had to go back to the drawing board. Um, we took the existing findings from the literature as well as our own findings and the information that we got from the respondents to develop uh, very context specific, uh, easy to understand, visually appealing uh, comic books. Um, and the idea is obviously to translate all of these comic books into local languages so that any of the practitioners, nonprofit institutions, uh, or even academics can pick those up and uh, use them in the, in, in the population. Um, we have two sets of these comic books, one for the migrant workers, and then we had to design a separate set for women because obviously their challenges were quite different. Um, we used two relatable characters, Radha in this case, and Saraswati. So Radha is uh, a lady who's having persistent problems managing her finances, where Saraswati is you know, using approachable solutions and navigating life pretty decently well. So how she helps Radha get out of these si sticky situations. Um, we used real life stories from all the piloting that we had done because we wanted women to connect uh, and get interested early on. So for example, as Deepthi was discussing, um, women were hiding money in precarious places and it was leading to all kinds of stress at home. So we used such an example in our stories. I feel like it might not be too clear, but then again, I think we have our uh, comic book in the back, so please do take a, take a look. Uh, similarly, one of the common problems that we were noticing is that women were using unregulated savings options, such as the chit funds, and there used to be a theft one every once in a while, and a large sum of money would sort of get lost. So we used that example as well, a very live example, in fact, from Dharavi. Um, so women uh, definitely connected to this example as well. Um, so one thing that, you know, when we, when we came here last year, there was some very good feedback that we got from uh, the participants. Uh, we really didn't, uh, I think our intention is not to drive uh, home the point that mobile banking options are the right options for you. You know, it is an ethnographic uh, research approach. Uh, we want to give them the option of both the traditional banking as well as going uh, with business as is. Um, so we wanted to first explain the diff importance of long-term savings uh, as well as short-term savings. Uh, the issues with cash on hand, uh, problems with unregulating sa unregulated savings instruments as well as um, savings institutions such as the CHIT funds, then describe to them the importance of banking services and the advantages of using the banks such as uh, uh, compound interests, as well as low-risk uh, investment options. Um, and then we sort of left it up to the respondents to decide if they were ready to work with us to either open a bank account or reactivate a bank account that they already had. Um, and that, we think, worked very well. It was not a forceful approach at all. It was an approach that was sort of led by the respondent herself. Um, so where we are at right now, we just designed all of our modules for women. Uh, there are about eight stories that we have. Based on the findings that we have from a migrant population, we are very excited. We think they did quite well. We're seeing an increase in the savings, and we're very hopeful that for our women, uh, women's group, we'll see something similar. So we are going to evaluate these uh, products for women uh, over a four months time. We're looking to evaluate or work with about 600 women this time around and see what the results uh, look like for us. So we will be sharing that with you hopefully soon. Uh, not only that, I think the intention all along was to make a product that is easily accessible to all of the practitioners. So we have been reaching out to nonprofit institutions and a lot of them have shown interest in these comic books and uh, the idea is to translate them into as many languages as we can. We have also recorded the training sessions uh, and we're gonna, sh we've put them on YouTube already and we'll continue doing so uh, even for the women's uh, group. Um, and, you know, lastly, we understand, I think 
a lot of us over here, I think, are very clear that financial literacy alone is not the answer to the financial inclusion problems. We completely understand that. Um, and we are noticing more and more now that we work in the field that there are many aspects to it. You definitely have the awareness issue. But then again, once you provide the training, it's also important that at the institution level, as in the bank, uh, at when the respondent goes to the bank, they have a good experience with the banking agents as well. And the psychological barriers that the, uh, that the respondents face when they go to the banks are quite significant and still a challenge, in fact. Um, so those are things that I think need to be looked at at a holistic sort of level if we want financial inclusion to be a success. Uh, but we still, I would say, are quite excited about the results we've found in our study, and we're eager to take your questions and recommendations. Thank you. And our final speaker, Idris. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Kone Idris. I'm a statistician and economist from the National School of Statistics of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, for who don't know very well Cote d'Ivoire, it is the leading economy in West Africa Economic and Monetary Union. It has been in crisis for 10 years, and uh, since 2011, it is in recovering with strong economic growth. Um, today I'm, I'm going to present to you the preliminary finding of our project, which title is Women, Monetary Practices, and Technological Innovation. <coughs> the title may seem quite general, but it reflects all of the questions we had in our mind when we were applying for the IMTFI call for proposal. Um, we were wondering how mobile money could be a tool in order to reduce poverty in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so that we identified monetary practices as economic channel, women as target group through which mobile money could uh, reach this goal. And we also focused our research on urban American women because these women um, have progressively take, taken in charge families during these 10 years of crisis. Uh, so the principal objective of our research is to show how a technological innovation like mobile money can modify the monetary practices of women in order to reduce poverty in Cote d'Ivoire. So <coughs> the first step of our investigation um, is to identify the factors that may explain the adoption of mobile money among our target group. So this research takes place in a, in a context where money transfer is, is, a usual, is a usual way to express social solidarity. For many years, um, using transport companies have been the main, the main mode of, of transferring money in Cote d'Ivoire, despite the, the presence of traditional, traditional firms like Western Union, which procedures were relatively more expensive and more complex for people. So um, in 2008, Orange Telecom has launched the first mobile money services in Cote d'Ivoire, which, which is called Orange Money. And um, one year later, its, uh, its principal concurrent, M10 Money, has launched M10 Mobile Money in 2011. And um, FM has launched Cellped. And last year, the third larger company, uh, the third larger telecom company, has launched Flues. And um, according to a recent report, Five million accounts uh, have been created between 2008 and 2014. And this, this increasing interest can be explained by different factors like um, the proximity of, of mobile money agents, the speed of mobile money transaction, and also the slight cost of mobile money services. In terms of research methodology, we have decided to we have decided to make a quantitative survey 
uh, on the in the market. As you can see uh, in the screen, we have a this market called Guru Market. In this market, women are, are specialized in in the sale of provision like uh, vegetable plantain, and this market has originally has originally been created by 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 Guru women. Guru is is an ethnic group of West region of Cote d'Ivoire where there, there is a there is large farm of this provision. So we have approached randomly 477 respondents with a questionnaire in order to in order to collect data on their access to mobile phone and mobile money services, their use of mobile money services, their perception of mobile money services following the, tec the technological acceptance model, their monetary practices, and also information about their age, education, marital status, and so on. And we have obtained is a, 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 a relatively young sample, uh, homogeneous according the occupation status, according the occupation status, but less educated as one in two respondents uh, had not at least the primary education, education, the primary school education level. And the third, the first, um, the first section of, of our questionnaire as um, we found that we found through we found through this uh, through the first section of our questionnaire that mobile mobile phone is a common good in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, we have found that mobile mo we have found that most of women have knew that it was possible to make transfer to make money transfer through a mobile phone they, they, they got information often through their, their parent or their friend but we have found that only 32 only 32 percent of women had a mobile money account in terms of the number of mobile money account the first provider was M10 money, follow, followed by orange money and flows. In term in terms of experience in using mobile money, we have found that in a late, a very late adoption of mobile money among these women, because if you if you look at the picture, seven in ten women, seven in ten women with mobile money account have created this mobile money at least four years after the launch of the first mobile money services in 2008. Furthermore, um, we have found that the Transfer and cash withdrawal are the most frequently used services. We found also that the trade is the main reason for using mobile money services. We, we, we choose to, to illustrate this result by the following, the following quote of a wholesaler of 45 years old with a secondary school education level. So she she told us that um, she was trading with a woman inside the country. She commissioned salad, tomatoes, and carrot. When and she she said that when she when she received this provision, she sold and brought him brought her his money her money through orange money. We. I've also assessed uh, the different perception on mobile money services through uh, following 
the technological asymptotes model, but instead of using and with the Likert scale equation, we have we have we have chosen to use the yes yes or yes or no question given the, the high rate of illiteracy in our sample. So to assess the passive ease of use, uh, we use two questions. Question does the use of mobile money sound you difficult? And we use the following question. Do you want a simplification of mobile money in order to in order to control the answer to the first to the first question? To assess the passive risk, we use the question twenty. Does mobile money seem you risky? And as a result, we have found that six in ten women can easily use mobile money services, but there is a significant a significant group of women with with significant risk um, relatively to mobile money. So we have found that the main we have found that the that the main fears are the possibility of being wrong recipient during a transfer. Or being hoped uh, phone or secret code. Uh, we have chosen to to highlight this result by this uh, by this quote of a wool seller of 30 years old, who who reported us that she decided to keep her money in Tontin after she she heard the mis misadventure of of a, of of this woman. Uh, here, here we have the different expression of uh, of the risk around mobile money services. So we have we have a woman, a retailer, who who say that it is that I, that mobile money is is not secured. Secured. Another woman say that uh, another woman was sure that the mobile money agent will steal her money. And uh, finally, we have a woman who, com who, who, who were complaining about the fact that mobile money agent uh, didn't, give, didn't give her all, your, all her money. Um, to assess the passive utility and the passive trust, we use the different, the different following question. Passive utility have, 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 has been assessed by question 18 and question 19. And uh, passive trust uh, has been assessed, assessed by question 23 and question 24. You can see that question 23 uh, has been used to, to assess um, explicit trust of the, the social environment of, of the women. And uh, question 24 has been used to, to assess the, the implicit trust of, 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 of the women. So in terms of results, we have found that, that mobile money has, that many women perceived mobile money as an opportunity to, to, to save time or to increase their revenue. But more than one third of women still have serious doubts about mobile money services. And so it would, for example, a wholesaler with 47 years old uh, said as, often there is a lot of people at Orange Money Agency, I must wait and that, that wastes my time. And find, and uh, we also assessed the, the different monetary practice of, of women. We have found that a low level of financial inclusion as more than eight women in 10, <coughs> eight women in 10 were with no access to financial services. So you can see on the figure that 85% more than 85% of women have no access to 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 tradition to traditional financial services. They still keep their money at home 
or in retouching. Uh, to finish, we, we, we have decided to, to run a logistic regression of the probability of having a mobile money account um, against with different, with different variable, demographic variable, and also the, vi the variable on perception of mobile money services. So in terms of results, we are obtaining that only education is significant in the adoption of mobile money services among a, among uh, among urban men and women. We have also found that passive ease of use is significant in uh, the adoption of mobile money services, and also the access, the using of orange mode of Orange mobile network is also significant in the adoption of mobile money services. So in, 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 in the first, in this first step of our project, we can say that a woman with a secondary school education with a significant passive ease of use and with an access to Orange mobile network is more likely to have a mobile money account. So um, the first, the next step of our, our research will permit us to assess the different change in uh, the monetary practice of women by running the different focus group. So thank you for your attention. So first, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists for their presentations today. <laughs> Second, we have about half an hour for questions, I believe. Uh, but before I got into that, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about an opportunity that with the foundation at the moment. We've just opened a window, uh, we call them grand challenges, that uh, fund proposals uh, in various areas. Previously, you might have heard we've had competitions to invent a new toilet. We've had competitions to improve the condom. Uh, and now, uh, a number of teams at the foundation have banded together to open a, a window to fund research and projects that help us to understand uh, how to extend services to women and girls. And those include teams like agriculture and sanitation, but the financial services team, of which I'm a member, is also part of this syndicate. And so I would invite all of you to go to our website, uh, grandchallenges.org, which uh, sets out in extensive detail the application criteria. I believe the applications are due around mid-January, but what we're looking for are potential new partners, uh, new projects, new research that will help us to understand how to reach women and girls in our target markets uh, more effectively. And obviously there's an opportunity. What we heard from our panelists today was that the level of women who are excluded from financial services is still incredibly high. Um, in Nigeria, it was more than 93% uh, of rural women uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, it was more than 80% of traders didn't have access to financial services. So we really believe that there is a gap and that we need to learn more about how to effectively reach women and girls. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for questions. I thought I would start with the first one, uh, looking across the three presentations to find some themes. Uh, first, uh, when it came to India and Cote d'Ivoire, both of the presentations focused on female merchants and entrepreneurs. And so I was interested to know whether you thought that what you had learned could potentially be generalized or extrapolated to, to apply to women more generally or to other markets. Uh, and second, for India and Nigeria, I was really interested to hear that mobile money adoption uh, and programs like financial literacy trading actually look like they can influence the level of savings and so I'm interested to know whether mobile money platforms uh, are not just for payments and transfers, for example, like M-Pesa, but might actually lead to women adopting other financial services like insurance, credit, uh, 
kind of other kind of more specific products like agricultural finance. So whether you saw mobile money platforms are potentially leading to the adoption of financial services beyond savings. Um, perhaps we can start with India and whether you thought that these lessons were maybe more broadly applicable than just uh, female entrepreneurs. Uh, so I'll answer the first part of the question and I'll let you answer the second part of the question. Um, so the first part of the question was whether the results that we found can be uh, applied to uh, the general population of women um, in, let's say, India. Uh, so our focus was primarily low-income women entrepreneurs, uh, but some of the common themes that we saw can definitely be applied to the women across the rest of semi-urban uh, or rural India. So we've done extensive uh, financial inclusion studies, uh, randomized control trials um, in uh, a, you know, majority of states in North India at this point, uh, focusing quite a bit on Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, which are quite underdeveloped at, uh, still. And uh, some of the things that we saw, the saving strategies, um, especially trying to keep the money away from uh, the men of the household so that it's not squandered away on temptation spending was a recurring theme for women. And we found that women were very eager to use banking services so that is definitely one of the differences that we saw quite early on is that uh, I think we m women are ready to use any sort of uh, you know, savings instrument that they can find. For example, um, you know, we've read about uh, women in, in South of India and they pay fi up to five rupees just to save about 20 rupees um, away from their house. So that is definitely something that we have seen that w women are willing to even pay to keep their money out of the hands uh, of, of, of sort of men in the house. So um, that's why we feel that uh, to, uh, products that are specific for women's needs are quite essential at this point. And I think that is also somewhat missing in the Indian context. So you do have products generally for the population, but products do not highlight women as the primary users. Um, so insurance products are not really directed towards women as such. Uh, savings devices are not really directed towards women uh, as such. We did notice that last year, two years ago, State Bank of India has started putting out ad, ad, ads for um, women that are saving for uh, their house, uh, for the purchase of their house, for example, for mortgage payments and things like that. So we see all of those things as very positive um, sort of steps. There's also an, initi an initiative for women's only banks, uh, and we're hoping that'll make some more difference and energize the savings uh, at banks for women. There's also the alternate channels, the self-help groups, et cetera, that uh, sort of promote you. Once you become a good saver, per se, then they promote you to, uh, uh, you know, to be able to uh, get low, um, low interest rate loans from uh, reputed banks in India. So all of those things are good, but definitely more needs to happen. And I'll let you. Yeah, I think so. Um, one thing is like uh, uh, what Mudita also captured was like most of the financial products, uh, in, uh, even when they are advertised, uh, they are not like targeting women. As for example, like any banking, you look at uh, any advertisement for any banking product, you'll only see women behind men. Like you will only see men as the main uh, player of any kind of financial product. So I think uh, even other products like insurance or, or the savings product and and somehow of the uh, financial institution uh, market it using women uh, as the some players and you know targeting women. Uh, we we really feel that there is a potential for take up of the such uh, financial products. Uh, okay. Um, regarding the question on the, the generalization of our, our different results, uh, I think that uh, we we can generalize our result to the to the women in rural rural area because um, bec because of the fact that our sample our sample was less educated. And and it, and it is and it is the same condition in the rural area. 
Uh, I will try to to respond to the over question to the over question later. Okay. Yeah, if I get you right, uh, one well, lady no further from uh, what you've done. Um, mobile banking services go beyond hardcore credit, and mm -hmm. then and then go to other non-financial or financial services like insurance savings. You. I think from my uh, from uh, do I work focused on how do mobile banking. Uh, alter certain behavior, yeah. social capital, and then a financial behavior of rural women to work, and then altering a cooperative practice, which we, yeah. But generally speaking, I, I, uh, to take it from the general perspective, I, using myself as an example, I, I am, I'm, 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 I'm part of a microfinance outfit, and uh, I chair the, the credit, the, uh, credit committee. We have a product we call a woof in my area. A woof literally means easy money. It's, it's like give you free money. So it's a way of uh, attracting the focus on women. A woof is active women upliftment fund. We have about almost 15,000 women in there. And um, I'm speaking, speaking generally because the, the key thing is if you, if, if, when they have need and you have products that can address it, certainly you buy into that. Like, in Nigeria, generally, is uh, the microfinance sector has not really grown. What is what is what is there mainly is, is the credit side, but insurance should be there, health should be there, agriculture should be there. Take our own product, our Woof, for instance. I'm speaking generally as a practitioner. The Woof has a component. There's health side of it. We get these women over three weekends. We give them financial literacy, get them acquainted to credit discipline, how to get themselves organized. Uh, get to take their PP practical. So it's a way of, uh, so yes, once you address their needs and um, in basically every insurance and what have you, you have to buy into it. But Nigeria, I must be very frank, we've been more into the credit uh, side. It's insurance, well, it's still, then agri, right? So that is that. I think the, the bottom line is um, if you have products that address the net, certainly buy into that. But in Nigeria, we've not really broadened. It's, it's more of a uh, credit, mainly uh, a credit. The other side, you know, but you can get uh, some financial institutions, uh, in that, but it's not really very general. But if you, if, if you, if you have a product that I can address needs of uh, clients, they certainly uh, buy into that. I think it's a good prospect if, uh, if it can be products are developed in that area. As long as the, the cost side of it is also taken care of because people care about what are we getting this? What's the cost element of a, of a, of a yeah. So, so mobile banking, if well, the product is well uh, designed and uh, is, is, is that, that will take care of the cost element, which is with uh, agents and transaction costs, these things are taking uh, is, 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 is that is that. Any questions? Yes, I'd like to thank uh, all three uh, presenters. And I have a question for the presenters uh, uh, from India. And you had mentioned that uh, the women did not go to banks unless they were accompanied by a man, either their husbands or their sons. Uh, and I was wondering if you could uh, speak more about uh, that dynamic. Uh, presumably these women were part of your uh, study on women entrepreneurs and whether you had addressed uh, that uh, phenomenon in your comic uh, books. Um, yes. One thing we uh, noticed was uh, 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 women were kind of intimidated by male staff uh, in the bank. Uh, and, uh, and we have highlighted this. Um, and also one thing is like all of the banking agents, um, 
okay, let me go. Like, uh, even in today also, somehow, like if you go to rural India or even in like low income household, somehow it is considered that, you know, going to bank, uh, you know, dealing with banks, officials and all is kind of a man's job. Uh, uh, that is kind of women feel that way. Uh, it's not only in Dharavi that I've worked in tribal region also in India and I've noticed that kind of, uh, uh, their notion about uh, banking services. And the other thing is like, again, uh, intimidated by male staff, uh, you know, it's just a cultural thing, just going there and talking with male staff uh, uh, was kind of, uh, they, they were not really open about that. Um, and thirdly, like, uh, somehow they thought like, uh, um, uh, if they are accompanied by uh, a man, uh, uh, it's easier to do the transaction or banking transaction. Uh, you do not find it uh, that much in our urban area, but especially in rural area, you'll find uh, women, you know, being accompanied by uh, male members. And uh, there was another study that we did in rural India. Many times it is also within from within the household. The, in this particular uh, research, we interviewed 3,000, more than 3,000 women, and we asked them if they are allowed to go to the financial institution uh, without being accompanied by somebody else. And only, I think, if I remember the number correct, correctly, I think around nine or 10 percent is women out of these 3,000, more than 3,000 women said they are allowed to go to bank on their own. So sometimes it is also from within the household itself, they are probably not allowed to go. Sometimes their own psychological barrier, you know, they find uncomfortable dealing with male staff, um, and and. The and just to add to that, that is exactly the reason why we, uh, you know, walk them through the importance of uh, formal banking, uh, you know, because it, it results in low uh, low risk investment. Uh, but that's why we want to sort of help them move towards mobile banking options. So using the ATMs um, for both withdrawals and deposits, using phone banking, which is quite readily sort of available through the uh, various banking um, uh, agencies that are already there, and also using Tatkal agents or like the agent banking where that you don't necessarily have to go to a bank and stand in line, but you can go to an agent and conduct your transaction much faster. And that's precisely what we are sort of trying to address uh, through these modules. Um, hello. I just want to thank everyone. Very good presentations. Um, I have a question for the India team. I really thought your product was very innovative and I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I just had a small question. I was wondering how did you manage to gain so much trust with the women that you um, interviewed to the point where they showed you their hiding places and told you about their experiences <laughs> and maybe you had some tips for me. <laughs> and also um, for the Cote d'Ivoire team, um, I just had a question about the risk. You said that there was a lot of perceived risk from the people who use the mobile banking services. Um, is there any real risk to back that? Uh, is there, um, is there, are any of their fears actually um, maybe uh, backed by real factors? I mean, that's it. Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, so when we first uh, went to Dharavi, um, women were not ready to talk with us also. Because um, uh, this, uh, some of these women were working for uh, this company called Lidget Papar. Um, and you know, there were some cases of s some outsider coming and taking their pictures of how they make the, that papar, some hygienic issues. So they were particularly asked not to speak with anybody outs from outside. But we made multiple trips, uh, you know, that is the, thing of using this ethnographic or you know qualitative research uh, is that you have to make multiple trips and Mudita and I were we didn't f first I remember Mudita and I went there with paper and pens and nobody was talking to us but then li gradually we just went there with our paper and pen we were just talking you know sometimes talking about our life story uh, our life uh, telling them stories and you know gradually asking them to open up about their uh, their life 
But that's why we followed these 25 women for almost two months. We made, I think, around 20 or 25 trips sometimes uh, to meet with these women uh, because they were not really opening up uh, uh, with their hiding places and all. So that, that, that's why our sample size is so small. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, we were practically just like camped outside their houses, pretty much. We were just always yeah. there, and we became a part. We literally became a part of the community after a while, and we were by like the twentieth day or, or after two weeks. We they knew that we were coming, and they were. I, I feel like respondents are eager to talk. Also, they want their stories heard, but it's just a matter of taking the time and having the patience sometimes. And we were lucky that it worked quite well for us. Uh, right, um, Vikeshwan. Vikeshwan was um, about the, the, pers the perceived risk uh, of mobile money services. Uh, I think that uh, given the, the, the increasing interest of mobile money services in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, I think that the, the, perceived, the perceived risks are only perceived bec because of the fact that these the women uh, who, who were, <coughs> who were uh, expressing this, this, this risk uh, were less educated and uh, also uh, they, had, they had less information about how they, have, they had less information about the using of mobile phone itself. So I think that these passive risks are are not are not real in in the daily experience of mobile money services. Thank you. Um, my first point, I think, is just to um, alert the group on the mobile financial services developments, particularly in East Africa, Tanzania being one of them. And I want to relate this with the um, whole issue of financial literacy. Uh, in the case of India, and whether we think it has uh, space to change, you know, the game. Um, what we have seen in Kenya and Tanzania, Uganda and other countries, with respect to huge adoptions of mobile money, there wasn't any education in that. Clearly not. So I think the question is, as we test these models, including the methodologies that we are using, uh, I think we should be learning from what has happened so far and if financial literacy was part of the game. And our own experience, we have been engaged in this um, area for quite some time. You know, no one stood up in the market, whether it's the government or anyone, telling the people, poor people in the villages, use a mobile phone, we trust it. No one did that. So I think the exposures and other mechanisms have uh, played to that. So at that point, I would like to ask um, a question to my um, colleagues from India. You know. We talk about financial interest, and I think that is a limited definition. Why should we not talk about financial capability? It's not only awareness, it's people making own choices in confidence. In the end, we talk about the behavior, financial behavior, that will tell us more about how they engage with money. So in this case, um, as you explore you know, the tools, you know, I wasn't clear what the research problem was, and therefore what the research question you wanted to answer out of this so that we can get uh, clear insights as to how they inform the behavior. Because in the end, it's financial behavior and how they use these platforms as mobile money so that they can make um, a, a useful contribution to their own lives. Um, the second issue is um, from the Nigerian colleagues. Um, you said in the presentation, Nigeria chose the bank-led model. So my question is, are you also investing through your research agenda, you know, the other alternative, the MNO-led, and how you could influence the government or the policymakers to have evidence on the table so that they can make informed choices. So I just want to know from you whether you are thinking alo along those lines. Um, in terms of um, the uh, methodology that um, we use, I've seen on the qualitative or quantitative side you know, structured interviews or in-depth interviews, uh, focus group discussions, these are qualitative. I think my question is, you know, how rigorous are these in order to give us robust conclusions? 
Um, I'll take the question about financial literacy, and I think we absolutely and wholeheartedly agree with you that uh, financial literacy itself is a very limiting term, and we should focus on the overall financial capability, because at the end of the day, you are trying to address the behaviors or the s barriers that are preventing people from making um, decisions that deep down inside they already know are good for them. So we totally recognize that and we absolutely agree with uh, you. Uh, one thing that we realized is in our study, we were working with a very specific group of entrepreneurs who uh, themselves uh, requested uh, information uh, about financial products and services that were already available in the market. In our case, in this study, access to a financial institution was not a problem. They were already in an urban center with multiple banking options available, uh, mobile as well as traditional brick and mortar uh, options available. So that wasn't an issue, uh, but, but the people did keep saying to us, both women as well as the migrant workers, that you know they just didn't know enough about the products uh, and what was going on inside the banks and they were afraid to even step inside the bank. So our attempt was to mitigate that issue through this research. But obviously we want to take it a step further um, and uh, try and see how this can be applicable in other uh, regions, in other contexts. And so uh, we keep going back to this discussion and we think that it's at least uh, on the surface a three-layered uh, sort of an issue. You have the, the physical access to a bank, um, then you have the issue of knowledge and awareness about the product. Uh, but then it's also the institution that people deal with. Even if you can, let's say, get the education, you can get your banking forms, you can, get, you can save money, you can go to the bank and be refused service. And that happens all the time with low-income um, uh, respondents. And that is a significant barrier. No matter how much you educate a person, that doesn't guarantee that the funds will go into the bank account or not. Um, and that's where we think mobile banking services provides such an opportunity. Um, and uh, we really think that is an answer, at least for the women entrepreneurs uh, in, in our case, because they've shown such eagerness to just walk up to an ATM and learn how to use it themselves. So we do see an incredible opportunity to improve capability, financial capability here. Um, and I absolutely agree with the fact that we should be addressing this as a capability challenge, not just an or an awareness challenge. Um, okay, Nigeria shows bank-led model for some reasons. One, the Central Bank of Nigeria was very cautious um, because of the turbulence in the banking sector. Um, the financial system was not stable, so they were afraid of allowing the MNOs to monopolize the system again. And the Nigerian bond money s market is fragmented, so they are be very being very, very cautious. They know the implication that Allowing the MNOs to move on, it could spread, it, the adoption could be higher, but they prefer to be cautious because of the financial challenges the market is facing. Um, it's one of the questions we raised in the study, so we want to look, um, to, to look into it in detail and discover conditions under which the bank-led model could be preferable to operator-led model. We have that into consideration. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then. Okay, uh, I'm Jean Gustav from Mercy Corps, also a former IMTFI researcher. I have a quick comment, um, comment, a request, and a question. Uh, comment first, uh, I'm doing some work in the Philippines uh, helping typhoon survivors. As you are probably aware, we, just, we were just hit again by a typhoon, and I almost did not make it here. Uh, one of the projects we're doing is uh, developing also a financial education uh, intervention for typhoon survivors. Uh, and what we're doing now is also developing stories, but the delivery, the, the delivery channel is not through comics, but through SMS. SMS messages and voice call messages. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Engage Spark. Engage Spark is a partner of ours, and we've tried it, tried uh, sending the SMS stories to all our beneficiaries. Now, um, that's the comment. The request is, uh, we are now in the process of developing new stories, and I would really appreciate getting a hard copy of your, uh, of your uh, Finlit tool. 
And uh, the other request would be, if you can come to the Philippines, maybe IMTFI would be generous enough to bring you to the Philippines and to help me. <laughs> that would be definitely great. And my question is, this is a poll question. Um, for each story that we're having, so it's a telenovela. Uh, a telenovela story is like a segment. So we have a one storyline. So per, story, per segment, there's a poll question. Just to check whether the, the recipient of the story is reading the SMS and uh, maybe finds it interesting. So my poll question to you is, I, I think you developed seven stories, right? And I'd like to ask the, the researchers from India, since we're just going to develop three stories, which among the seven stories would you want me to prioritize if you're my partner? You can answer that later. <laughs> later uh, <laughs> or you, you can maybe share that if uh, we have time. I would say uh, savings, uh, the first two, uh, like increasing saving. But Mudita, do you have something else? I, uh, I let's start with that, uh, how to increase savings. Uh, and Mudita, what do you I definitely think, but I think we also need to understand the context in which you want to deliver these uh, the, the, uh, these trainings. So if it is to do with the um, s sort of helping people go more to the banks, then we have uh, you know information about that. But then again, if you want to help people adopt more of the mobile technology tools, then we certainly uh, you know can accommodate that as well. And that's again very region specific because you know you could use provider names uh, or you could use certain technology names uh, to just sort of facilitate that learning process a little bit more. As far as uh, your invitation to come to Philippines, I think Bill has heard the request, so <laughs> I hope we can figure that out. And uh, as far as the SMS uh, component is concerned, I think you know. Um, from what I understand, I forget the RCT and where it was conducted, and forgive me for that, but uh, SMS reminders uh, that are very uh, sort of context specific, again, um, depending on the savings need, have shown to work. I think it was done in Philippines from what we understand, and we can discuss about that, but that's, that's one of the ideas that we've had, um, and it can be specific for the particular client as well, uh, that you know, if you're saving for marriage, let's say, then just send out a reminder for that, and that seems to work quite well, stick quite well with people. Um, also, like uh, what we will, uh, we're also doing is like this: um, uh, the tools uh, itself, uh, as Mudita said, uh, first we have to understand the background. Uh, and we also, I just want to add that for uh, to test the the woman, uh, the literacy tools that we developed for women. What we are doing is like, so we are doing this with a bigger group, uh, or around 600 women. So first, when you are talking about the uh, importance of savings, and when we are not talking about banking services and all, we are actually giving a randomly selecting around 300 women and giving them locker box uh, because there are a lot of studies that you know if you give uh, training on uh, importance of saving and just giving locker box, there is an increase in uh, saving amount. Um, so first we want to see if they can save because it again goes back to that financial capability like you know um, uh, and once we know they can save then again only we can talk about you know banking services and all those things and I just want to add another thing is also that is one thing we are doing another thing we want we are also doing uh, for our second study is uh, randomly uh, uh, we we are also including husbands uh, you know because we are talking about women we are talking about women's decision but if we forget husbands uh, you know they really influence women's decision so when we are giving this financial literacy to women we are thinking of including husbands uh, randomly you know selecting some women and including husbands and for whom for some women not including husbands and we'll, we want to see the uh, change in behavior uh, so th that's just a wonder to add in the thing I think we're running over, but we've got one more question. I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> my interest is also in the financial literacy, as my colleague in Tanzania uh, mentioned. I'm interested in the aspect of language in terms of literacy. Um, one of the tensions we saw in Kenya is that it's a tension between the awareness, advertisement, you know, promote promotion versus the knowledge and education. What we found is a lot of people want the knowledge in vernacular languages, especially in rural areas, versus the companies that tend to promote in national languages or <laughs> foreign languages. How did, you, 
how do you deal with that, especially when you're developing curriculum? Because I, I, feel, I feel like even in Kenya, we still have a gap. I mean, the number of people who kept saying, and here's what we found, there's a risk to it because some people heard it on radio, they got excited, oh, loan, Mshwari, loan. They signed up for it, but they didn't hear enough to understand it. Right. And so this is where I have the tension is the language aspect. No, you're absolutely right. We converted, uh, we have translated this financial literacy tools in Hindi. One thing I want to um, uh, just share is like, uh, you saw the, uh, the data for migrant population, right? How they were, uh, the expenses decreased and savings increased. So most of our migrant population and our study reason, they were from Bihar. And the trainers we brought, they were also from Bihar. Uh, it, it, we didn't plan, but it just so happened. So like when I was in the field, like these trainers, we trained these trainers for 10 days. We, uh, we gave them rigorous training, like how they should speak to the migrants and all. And when they were talking to migrants, they were not educating them. They were like just talking, like, you know, uh, talking about issues. And I, I feel, I mean, I don't have scientific data for that, but I really feel that really influenced our result, we, such a positive result, such a promising result. That's also because of the, because they were speaking exactly their language. They were using the native, uh, uh, you know, uh, dialect. Not only that, they were also using stories from the Bihar, like these uh, trainers were like, we have also come from Bihar, you have also come from Bihar, uh, but so I really understand what you're going through, but hey, this is these are the options. So that connection was there. Uh, so I, re uh, I, uh, I, I, I think language and that uh, connection, uh, you know, connection of the message is very important. Just uh, information, just generic information is not uh, uh, really helpful. That's what Mudita also mentioned uh, in the th one of the slides. You wanna add something? Okay, hey, well, three very different uh, markets, three very different research papers, but one very encouraging message that we're starting to make inroads into female financial inclusion. So uh, please have a look at the Gates Foundation's uh, Grand Challenges for Women and Girls, and please also join me in thanking our speakers this afternoon. Thank you.